Thank you, Drake, for including me with the, uh, you mentioned the younger men. I guess I'm young compared to Uzzelon. <laughs> um, tonight, uh, my topic is uh, turning hearts toward heaven. And before I begin, I'd like to thank the elders for uh, producing the, this uh, lectureship for all of us and give us this opportunity. But I'd also like to thank Kenny. Uh, he took the entire day yesterday to coach each one of us individually, and I really appreciate that, the time he spent and the help that he gave each one of us. I, I, I really needed that. So my first question for tonight is, how do we turn hearts toward heaven? To answer this question, I'd like to go back to the beginning. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 39. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and, Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to all your children and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. <coughs> it is clear when a person repents and is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul has a lot to say about the interaction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, Paul said, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. When we are led by the Holy Spirit, we are sons of God. The Holy Spirit has an active role in our lives. The role that Paul is talk talking about in this particular scripture is one of leadership. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. We see from this scripture that we are made sons of God through adoption. And we have his spirit in our hearts. Abba in verse 5 is not the Swedish musical group you have seen in the movie Mamma Mia. It, it's actually an Aramaic word for my father. It's a very respectful way for a child to refer to their father uh, and very personal. It definitely should never be used or, or translated as daddy, though. No, it's, it's not um, that frivolous. Abba is a very, very dignified way to honor and recognize your father. So we can see in this verse that with verse 5, I believe, is saying is with the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we can call out to our Father in heaven. Two other scriptures that point out that God's Spirit is in our hearts are. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us in God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Then in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length, depth and height. So far we've examined when we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when we are led by the Holy Spirit, we are sons of God. 
because we are sons of God, we have his spirit in our hearts. And we, are, we, we can then call out to our Father in heaven. So the importance of the Holy Spirit can never be underestimated. As we see from the, our next scripture, the Holy Spirit has a very powerful purpose in our lives. So this one's kind of long, but we're going to look at this in a little bit more in depth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 14. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not in the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of God except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So verses, starting at the top, verses 6 through 8, men's wisdom and power mean nothing, because God's wisdom is a mystery to them. And verse 8 implies that Jesus is this, is this mystery, because if men knew that Je who Jesus was, they wouldn't have crucified him. Verse 9, Paul quotes Isaiah 64, verse 4, and we can conclude from this passage that before Jesus, man's heart did not know or understand God. Verses 10 and 11, God's mysteries are revealed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, since we have received the Holy Spirit, we can know things related to God. In verse 13, the Holy Spirit allows us to teach God's word and all things of a spiritual nature. And finally, in verse 14, worldly men find spiritual teaching foolish because they don't have the Holy Spirit. When we have been baptized into Christ and received the Holy Spirit, it seems that we are uniquely qualified to understand God's word and to teach it. Without the Holy Spirit, God's word and spiritual matters don't make sense. Without the Holy Spirit, heaven is a very difficult thing to understand. Baptized believers who are led by the Holy Spirit are the only people able and qualified to turn hearts toward heaven. So how do we turn hearts, how do we turn hearts toward heaven? Be baptized into Jesus Christ. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Have the Spirit of God in your heart and you'll be able to know and to teach the spiritual matters of God and his word, including heaven. So my next question is, what is heaven? For that, I'd like to read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5. through five. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So heaven is an incorruptible inheritance that is reserved for those who are born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can see also that heaven is perfect and eternal. We're going to look at this passage a little bit more in depth and refer back to it a couple times. Uh, 
Right? In verse 3, uh, Peter says that we have been begotten again to the resurrection of Christ. The word begotten is an interesting word because it literally means to be related by blood. So the next question is, how are we related to God by blood? The book of Acts is a really important book, um, also one that may be underestimated by the, a, a lot of churches. We're going to go back real quickly to um, Acts chapter 2. In verse 41, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. If you skip down to 40, verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily, those who are being saved. So in Acts chapter 2, we can see that through baptism, we are added to the church. Now later in the book of Acts, in, verse, in uh, chapter 20, verse 28, Paul is here, he's speaking to the Ephesian elders, and he told them, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased, with his own blood. So Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. We are related to God through Jesus' blood. When we are members of the church, we have that relationship with him through his blood. We have been got, begotten to God through the blood of Christ. I'd like to go back real quick to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 again. Peter said we are begotten again or literally, we are born again. So how can we be born again? John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. Notice Jesus said, water and Spirit. So Romans chapter 6, a very familiar verse. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So Paul explains that baptism is our rebirth, that we are raised out of the water of baptism, we are raised in newness of life. Thus, we are begotten again by God. One more time back to 1 Peter. When we are baptized, we are born again and begotten of God to an inheritance reserved in heaven for you. My final question tonight, what will heaven be like? So Revelations chapter 7, verses 15 through 17. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them into living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We see here that heaven is an eternal throne of God. We will praise and worship him. He will dwell with us. There will be no more hunger, heat, or thirst. Jesus will be our shepherd, and we shall drink living water. There will be no more tears, because God will wipe them away from our face. But if you want a glimpse of heaven right now, then I suggest you look to your left, and then look to your right. Brothers and sisters, Lord willing, each one of us will be gathered there on that great day. And those that we see here tonight will be the ones worshiping him in person and be able to partake in his glory. And I guess another way to think about heaven right now is the church. What we're doing right now, worshiping God and in spirit and in truth is what we can see is happening in Revelation 7, that we will be worshiping him in person. 
and Jesus will be in our midst as he is right now. I'd like to thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to turn the services over to JR.